Okay. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, welcome to the Conservation Lecture Series, and thank you for coming today. I am Margaret Mantor. Uh, I work for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I'm in the Habitat Conservation Planning Branch. Uh, I am very happy to get things started for today um, by letting you know that we have a website for the lecture series that is accessible to everyone. So this is the website for it. Um, please take a look. You can see the schedule of lectures that we've got planned. You can register for any of our upcoming lectures um, to attend them live or over WebEx. You can attend um, either way and register either way on this website. And you can also see videos of lectures that we've had in the past on this website. And you can get the uh, PowerPoint materials from those lectures here as well. If you have any questions about the website or about the lecture series, um, please feel free to contact me. And uh, just to give you an overview of lectures we have coming up, this is just this month, actually. We, we sort of packed them in this month. Um, we're having one next week on Cactus Wren. That's going to be out of our San Diego office. We're going to have one here in Sacramento on Alameda Stripe Racer, another on California Tiger Salamander. Um, that will also be here in Sacramento. And then we're going to have Shasta Crayfish at the end of the month, and that is going to be out of our Reading office. So today, um, I'm really happy to um, introduce Dr. Ben Sachs, who's going to be giving a lecture on Sierra Nevada Red Fox and Sacramento Valley Red Fox. He um, completed his undergraduate degree in biology at the University of Maryland and his master's degree in wildlife biology at UC Berkeley, and his PhD in ecology at UC Davis. Uh, he completed a postdoc at UC Davis in population genetics, and he's now an adjunct professor um, and the director of the Canid Diversity and Conservation Unit, which is now called the Mammalian Ecology and Conservation Unit, and that's in the Veterinary Genetics Laboratory at UC Davis. He also served as a professor at Sacramento State University in the biology department for four years. Uh, Dr. Sachs's lab works on a variety of wildlife in California and elsewhere, and that includes the endangered salt marsh harvest mouse, giant kangaroo rats, North Pacific albatross, and most recently working with the department on um, developing cost-effective approaches for estimating deer abundance using non-invasive genetic um, mark recapture methodology. So we're really excited to have him here today. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming and uh, giving me the uh, chance to talk about one of my favorite subjects, foxes. So give me a bear with me while I figure out how to work this contraption. All right. Okay, so uh, to give an overview of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, first I want to kind of get started by giving an overview of the evolutionary history and biogeography of red fox as a species. And then in that context, I want to kind of pare us down to the particular red foxes that we have here in California, and then look a little bit at some of the indicators we have of their population trends over the past century or so and their current status. And that's going to lead me into talking about two, our two native, uh, thank you, our uh, two native populations of, of red fox we have in California, the Sacramento Valley red fox and the Sierra Nevada red fox. And a lot of that will be sort of telling you about uh, what we've learned in the last decade or so and sort of where we are now, because uh, both of those areas we have active research going on. Okay, so uh, biogeography uh, bio and taxonomy, uh, it's, uh, like, like many uh, taxa, it's, it's sort of had a tumultuous history, the taxonomy and naming. Uh, we do know uh, from the fossil record that red foxes evolved somewhere between two and four million years ago in Eurasia and Northern Africa, and only uh, came into North America about half a million years years to 300,000 years ago or so, uh, a little before during the Illinois glaciation. 
what uh, many of you may not realize is that up until uh, 1959, uh, it was uh, fairly well accepted that the North American red fox was a distinct species from the Eurasian and African red fox, um, and that was known as Vulpus fulva, uh, with, uh, with the red fox and the rest of the world being Vulpus vulpus. Uh, but after um, uh, Churcher's morphometric study uh, in the 1950s, he uh, recommended that they be lumped for what, in retrospect, I think is uh, fairly superficial uh, character data. Uh, but in any case, currently the red fox is vulpus vulpus throughout the world, and this map below shows more or less its, its contemporary range. And uh, along with the gray wolf, the red fox has the largest natural distribution of any non-human land mammal. Okay, I'm going to pause here for just a second, and I promise this is not going to be a highly technical talk, but I do want to sort of make sure we're on the same page with a couple of uh, DNA tools that I'm going to refer to sort of off and on throughout the talk, and, and so best to just go ahead and tell you a little bit about these, uh, these uh, two types of DNA. So the first type of DNA that, that uh, I'll be referencing are mitochondrial DNA, and mitochondrial DNA uh, is found in the mitochondria, uh, uh, an organelle in our cells, and is passed on primarily from uh, mother to offspring, or if you go backwards, from offspring to mother, it came from the mother, from the grandmother, the great mother, grandmother, etc. And that makes it kind of a nice phylogenetic marker because, because the entire, there's about 16,000 bases, and that's, you know, the ATs, Gs, Cs, uh, in the mitochondrial genome, and that's passed completely unbroken, intact, from mother to daughter on down. So, so it gives us a really nice lineage to trace. Uh, they tend to mutate at more or less predictable rates, so they have a built-in molecular clock that allow us to sort of reconstruct evolutionary trees and then use the amount of branches and the lengths of those branches, which are based on mutation, to estimate things like divergence or time since isolation. But they can also be, if we, if we rely entirely on these matrilines, we're, uh, we're only looking at 16,000 base pairs and one hereditary unit of the entire genome. Nuclear, uh, the other kind of DNA, nuclear DNA, that's the DNA that are in the chromosomes in the nucleus of the cell. And that's the DNA that you get copies of from both mother and father. It's also the DNA for which most of what defines an organism, what most of which codes for things that may be locally adapt adaptive, sex determination even, is all in the nuclear DNA. So from a functional perspective, it's the nuclear DNA that is typically most important. Um, it's... Um, it's not as easy to use as a phylogenetic marker because, uh, because the little, even though there's three billion bases, every time a gamete is formed, an egg or a sperm, genes are taken randomly. So for example, we, we all for eye color would get one gene from our mother, one gene from our father, but whether the maternal gene came from our maternal grandmother or maternal grandfather depends on a flip of the coin, which is why my brother may have a different maternal gene for his eye color than I do. And so you can imagine if you go back in time and you trace each gene through time, through the possible ancestors that many generations back, every single gene in your genome has traveled a different route through time. So the mitochondria gives us one gene tree. The nice thing about it is it's really powerful for reconstructing that gene tree. But if we are able to construct gene trees from our nuclear genes, every tree is a little bit different. And when we make decisions like what a distinct species is, what we want to be doing is basically taking all these nuclear gene trees or some estimate of them together and seeing what the consensus is, what are the paths or populations that they all travel through together. And so nuclear markers are, uh, are very good uh, for ultimately determining species-level questions, systematics, and taxonomy. Mitochondrial just give us 
a nice first pass at that. Um, nuclear uh, DNA is also the DNA we use to determine things like individual identity from fingerprints, you know, DNA fingerprints, uh, relatedness, how to determine from the DNA uh, parent-offspring relationships, uh, as well as uh, gene flow between populations. So both of these DNA types are really important, and I promise that's the most you're going to hear me talk about, anything technical for the rest of this talk. This is one of those trees made, uh, reconstructed from mitochondrial DNA. These are, okay, the word haplotype I use, it's a, a, a specific DNA sequence. So every one of these little numbers is just the name of a haplotype and it differs from the one next to it maybe by one base, maybe one has an A and the other has a T, for example. And the, the more similar these haplotypes are to one another, the closer they are on the tips of the branches of these trees. Um, and you can also see that some of these branches are clustered. So, for example, this is a branch, and when you get a nice big cluster where all of those haplotypes can trace back to a single common ancestor, we refer to that as a clade. So this clade uh, is, is a, we call it the Nearctic clade. It is found only in North American red foxes. And we can age that clade, and it's somewhere between 100 and 300,000 years, and that tells us something about how long red foxes have been isolated in North America. We also have red foxes in Alaska and Western Canada that contain some of these haplotypes in what we call the whole Arctic clade. That clade uh, uh, encompasses haplotypes from both Eurasia, Africa, and North America. So, so the, those matrilines got to the North American continent much more recently than the ones in the Nearctic clade. Okay. This is a, a great cartoon uh, that kind of describes what we think, uh, based on this mitochondrial DNA, uh, a, a few things are going to be revised based on subsequent data, but this cartoon was uh, uh, put together by my more technically minded uh, student, Marcel Moore. Um, and what this shows is uh, 500, 300,000 years ago, during the Illinoisan glaciation of the Pleistocene, there was a giant ice sheet covering most of North America, which isolated uh, the southern part of the continent from basically Alaska. And at the same time, Alaska was connected by the Bering Land Bridge to Eurasia. And that's when we think red foxes first came over. And we have a nice carbon dated, radiocarbon dated uh, red fox skull from Alaska that, that supports that. Uh, during the Illinoisan glaciation, there were sort of a lot of climatic fluctuations, and during the warmer parts of this glacial period, uh, the two major ice sheets, the Laurentide and Cordilleran ice sheets of North America, separated and created a, uh, a corridor, basically, of unglaciated um, landmass where red foxes apparently passed through. And again, we have a 200,000-year-old fossil from Alberta that, that sort of supports this. Okay. Subsequently, um, after the end of the Illinois glaciation, we had a warming period, the, uh, the Sangamon interglacial, and uh, red foxes spread throughout the southern portion of the continent. Again, we have lots of fossil evidence of this. Um, and then during the Wisconsin glaciation, that's the last glaciation of the ice, uh, of the ice ages, uh, during periods of climatic warming, uh, the, the aridity in the central part of the continent began to transform what were initially forests into grassland. And, and apparently, uh, based on where and when we're finding red fox skulls, the grassland was not a real favorable uh, habitat, and so we saw isolation between eastern and western red foxes. And then we had uh, at least uh, from the mitochondrial perspective, about 50,000 years ago, we had a little dose of the whole Arctic clade, some mitochondrial matrilines come across the Bering Land Bridge. And then for the last 10,000 years, our continent's been completely isolated to uh, Eurasia with a few human-assisted exceptions. Um, so at, at the end of the ice, at the onset of the Holocene, uh, a couple things happened as the ice sheets melted in the west. 
uh, the, the, as our story goes, the uh, western red foxes basically followed the glaciers up in elevation into the Rockies, the Cascades, and the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And the eastern red foxes followed the glaciers up in latitude up into eastern Canada and started to spread out toward the northwest. In the meantime, Alaskan foxes, which all carried the uh, Eurasian mitochondrial DNA, began to spread uh, southeast until we had reached a situation, this is more or less our present situation, where we have natural lines of red foxes sort of uh, having made contact and integrating from Alaska through southeast Canada. But we also have the western mountain foxes isolated, and, and where they have been for the past 400,000 years from any European or Eurasian uh, red foxes, and, uh, and a little more recently from the eastern ones. Okay, well, that's the story as we understood it uh, several years back, and the most important aspects of this story are all still true. We've since looked at nuclear DNA, and we have a much better sense of things. And as, as refers to the, the uniqueness of our western red foxes, nothing's changed. But one thing has changed, which is that what we had initially interpreted as uh, a second wave of red foxes coming over the, the Bering Land Bridge, uh, we now see as actually it was just a, a rare uh, interchange and introgression of mitochondrial DNA. So basically, it could have started from a single hybridization between North America, a North American red fox and a Eurasian one that passed that mitochondria you know, that, that those offspring could have backcrossed with native North American ones, passed the mitochondria on down female lineages. Uh, but if there was something about that mitochondrial genome that was adaptive, uh, it could spread through selection, like wildfire, which is what we think happened, uh, with the rest of the genome being relatively intact. And when we look at the nuclear uh, DNA, that's what we see. This is a nuclear gene tree, and this is a whole bunch, it's sort of averaged over a whole bunch of different nuclear genes. And uh, the important thing here is this node, uh, which estimates a difference between the North American red foxes, which includes the Alaskan ones here, uh, and all Eurasian red foxes. And that's estimated at about 340,000, give or take 100,000 years. Uh, so that concords very well with the age of our first mitochondrial uh, North American red fox clade. So we now actually, uh, we have a paper that's in review, so this is sort of an active area, and it's, you know, it's right on the cusp of, of is this, do we go back to the old, this is a new species or not, and we'll have to let the peer review uh, process sort that out, but basically right now we're, we're arguing that uh, North American red foxes should go back to being vulpus fulva. Uh, and you can see a picture of a European one and a, and a North American one here, and uh, without having done any formal uh, morphometric analyses, uh, Mark and I have this little game where we will Google images and look at them, and we, we always agree on whether it's a Eurasian red fox or whether it's North America. They do look different, just haven't done the measurements to be able to say how they differ. Um, in terms of putting it in perspective, um, another vulpus pair of species, this is swift fox and kit fox, which uh, which are considered different species. They also look different. Uh, and those are, are about as divergent as North American and Eurasian red foxes. So, um, and just to sort of show, I actually stole this from a bear paper. I, I didn't steal it, see, I'm, I'm referencing it. Uh, but I, it, it, basically, uh, it basically shows, this is with explaining a similar situation with polar bears and brown bears, where for the longest time we, based on mitochondrial DNA alone, we had somewhat of a misunderstanding of the systematics. Well, in this case, imagine it's foxes, and this first uh, little, uh, this first little black branch, let's just consider that kit foxes, that's not the important one. And this is a node about 300,000 years, and these big, thick branches are the nuclear trees. That's what the nuclear genome is showing us. And this is, uh, this is North American, and this is Eurasian. And then much more recently, 50,000 years ago, we just had a little, whoops. Uh, 
a little little introgression there in the mitochondrial DNA gene tree flips over to uh, to the other side, and so we get a discordance. Okay. Now that I've dispensed with all of the biogeographic and systematic background, let's let's come back down to earth and talk about the situation in California. Okay. So going back to where I left off on the end of the uh, of the, the ice ages, our story that basically these western red foxes followed the glaciers up in elevation, uh, and that's why we find all of our native montane uh, western red foxes up in the subalpine zone at and above tree line, um, because that's sort of the, the last bastion of the glaciers. But then we have this issue. We have this one problematic population here in the Sacramento Valley. Um, and this is only, this has sort of been one of those problems that's been gnawing at people uh, since, uh, since Grinnell in the early 1900s. Uh, Grinnell, Grinnell sort of did, wasn't even aware of this population until the 1920s, and then he and his colleagues sort of set out to talk to homesteaders and various people and get oral history from around the valley. And, pretty quickly concluded that these foxes, as long as they could trace back from people that were still alive, had been there at least as far back as 1880, and most of the people believed that they were there naturally. So nobody had any record that they were ever brought there, uh, but just based on how incredibly different the habitat was, more desert-like than boreal, um, Joseph Grinnell had a real hard time uh, uh, sort of uh, reconciling this, and so he, he put out there, mainly he scratched his head. He didn't come to any conclusions at all, but he put out there the possibility that perhaps these foxes were planted there by man, I think, to put it in his words, uh, although he didn't really have a good explanation as to how that would have been, because this was back before cars, and uh, it wasn't so easy to get foxes all the way from the east, for example, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the west. Um, of course, I suppose they could have been moved from the Sierras. Um, so where did they come from? Really, it wasn't until the 60s um, when a hypothesis came out that really got some traction, and that was Arian Reis. Uh, uh, he had done a morphometric study and realized that the Sacramento Valley red foxes were a lot larger than Sierra Nevada red foxes, Rocky Mountain, Cascades, all these subalpine foxes. He, and he measured eastern foxes and, and Alaskan foxes. And he got the closest match in size to foxes from the Midwest. And he kind of looked at a map and he said, I've got it, of course, the Transcontinental Railway. It was established. It goes right through Iowa and Missouri uh, and, 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 was, and made it all the way to Sacramento in 1869. So, so that was it. We finally had a, a reasonable explanation for how they could have gotten there. It matched the morphometrics. And since that time, it just became sort of, uh, it became fact that these were non-native foxes from the east. And any field guide you look at, um, you know, from the 70s on, maybe maybe not in the last 10 years, will just, or even scientific articles and books, will simply mention this as fact. Um, this is a, a paper by uh, Jeff Lewis that was done in the, uh, well, the survey they did was in the, in the 90s. Um, a really nice, extensive survey where they documented uh, the occurrence of low elevation red foxes in California. And you can see on the right that's their, uh, their map, all the, the dots are these low elevation foxes. And then they compared that to a survey done by Gray in the mid-1970s uh, when most red foxes were, were those in the lowland were in the Sac Valley, and then to Grinnell's data points from, from the earlier part of the century. Um, and they, they fit a really nice exponential curve to the area of this expansion and, and sort of uh, uh, showed that it looked like potentially these non-native, as they were assumed to be all foxes in the lowlands at that time, had expanded exponentially. Um, they, uh, they also acknowledged a little bit, they, they had an issue that didn't quite fit the puzzle, which is they knew that some of these foxes came from fur farms. So, uh, so the problem is there. The first foxes ever bred in captivity were bred in 1895 on Prince Edward Island. Really difficult to get red foxes to breed in captivity, and and once 
once they sort of figured out how to do this and that they could make nice silver coats and it became profitable, then they started selling breeding pairs. And it really wasn't until about 1915 before fox farming became exported uh, more widely than just southeastern Canada. Uh, so that wouldn't explain how foxes got here in the late 1800s, but it would explain potentially how some of these other ones did. So that was just kind of left as a hanging question mark by, um, by Jeff Lewis and, and Rick Olightly and, and others um, as to, to, to what extent were these lowland foxes from the Sac Valley and to what extent might they actually reflect some subsequently brought in uh, fur farm escapees or, or releases. Well, fortunately, these are really uh, easy hypotheses to test, uh, at least you know, where, with, with genetic data, where did these foxes come from? So, um, so we did that. We, uh, we went and we uh, sampled museum specimens from the Smithsonian, the National Museum, uh, from the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at Berkeley, and several other collections, and were able to get red fox skins and skulls collected as far back as 1850 from all over the North American continent and parts of Eurasia. And first pass, we, we looked at nuclear and mitochondrial, but I'm just going to talk about the mitochondrial because they don't disagree and it's an easier story. Um, we were able to sort of uh, categorize things as, uh, based on that, that map, uh, color-coded, uh, blue is going to be these native mountain ones uh, versus yellow for the eastern and Alaskan ones, and simply compare what we found in the Sacramento Valley, both in the early 1900s and today, and what we found was that, well, everything came from the West. So at least we can rule out Iowa and Missouri. They definitely didn't come from the Midwest. Now, still possible that they came from Utah, maybe the Uintas or the Wasatch or the Southern Rockies. You know, they may not be California natives. So um, you can actually look at this mitochondrial DNA with a little bit more resolution. Um, so this, this is uh, another way like a tree, we call it a network. It's another way of representing haplotypes. So in this case, the central haplotype, every one of these circles or nodes is a distinct DNA sequence. Uh, so for example, I lost my hair. Uh, if we go from this, this central, an this would be the oldest, most ancestral, uh, ancestral. This one might differ by a single mutation from that one. And whoops, the one out the tip from that one would differ from by yet another mutation. And so this way you can kind of represent your haplotypes based on their ancestor descendant relationships. And the other nice thing about this is you can kind of color code them and then put them on a map and then that can give you a little bit more of a sense of, of uh, where things may have come from. And this, this was both helpful and not so helpful. And it was most helpful in that you can see from the network on the right side of the screen this light blue. Those haplotypes are found in the Sacramento Valley and nowhere else. And so that tells us, or at least the most likely uh, interpretation of that, is that these, these foxes have been isolated there for a very long time, so before people would have brought them there, at least before uh, European settlers would have brought them there. Um, the blue one that the single blue haplotype is from a, a fox in 1905 collected from the Sacramento Valley, and that happens to be uh, this central one right here. So that would be the one you'd expect. So, uh, so now we're, we're relatively confident, and like I said, the nuclear DNA support this, uh, that the Sacramento Valley red foxes are in fact native despite uh, the anomaly of their, their habitat use. So we now recognize four subspecies, native subspecies of western red foxes, of which Sacramento Valley red fox is the newest member. And the other one in California, of course, is the Sierra Nevada red fox. Okay, so, but before going on to talk about these two native subspecies, I would be remiss if I did not return to uh, Jeff Lewis's distribution map here. Um, what about all these other lowland red foxes. Well, it turns out, when we look at the mitochondrial DNA, we have two very, very different red fox populations. So, J 
Jeff was was absolutely right that um, that the expansion and spread of, of red foxes throughout most of California's lowlands were non-native red foxes, um, and and that's exactly what the mitochondrial DNA support. We just had to do one little modification to uh, to Jeff's story, which is that the ones in the Sacramento Valley are distinct and had nothing to do with that expansion. You might ask. Why didn't the Sacramento Valley red fox? And I would not have an answer, but it is a question that I wonder about. Okay, this is, um, this is a, just sort of a, another diagram showing more or less the same data, uh, color-coded the same way, but with, with subsequent uh, samples that we've collected. Except if you notice, most of these are triangles. There's some squares on there. And the squares, uh, the blue squares and the yellow squares, are ones from Aryan Reef's morphometric study back in the 70s. And we, we were able to get uh, John Perrine is now the curator at Kyle Poly, where uh, Aryan Reef's skulls are. So he was able to get us some samples for DNA analysis. And what's really interesting is that uh, it shows exactly the same pattern as we see today, which suggests that this, this sort of boundary between native and native, non-native lowland foxes hasn't really changed a lot in the last four decades or so. All right, well, that's all been mitochondrial, but if we really want to, mitochondrial can't tell you anything about hybridization. So if we want to see if these two populations of native and non-native foxes are, are at least hybridizing, you have to look at nuclear DNA. So what I'm showing you now are color, again, blue is native, yellow is non-native. And I, I'm sort of, uh, I'm sort of holding back a little. I'm not showing you all of our samples. I'm only showing you the samples that were pure native, and I should put pure in, in quotes because we can only really detect uh, genetic introgression about two to three generations back. But as best we can tell from the nuclear markers, these are only pure native red fox, uh, foxes and pure non-native red foxes. And what's really amazing about this is there's not a single exception, and actually this is really outdated, but we've still not found an exception uh, many years after this. Uh, we've never found a pure non-native fox in the native range, and we've never found a pure native fox in the non-native range. So whether we can notice the difference between them or not, they can certainly tell the difference between e each other. So they don't readily interbreed, and they don't readily go to the range of the other. Uh, however, they do hybridize. So now I'm doing the op. These are the ones I withheld in the last slide. Uh, these are all the samples we had that could not be clearly assigned to one or the other population, but showed uh, ancestry from both. These are the hybrids. And uh, what you can see is that they're not randomly distributed. They tend to be uh, a lot of them along the I-80 corridor and here uh, in uh, uh, the sort of uh, southeast quadrant of the valley, um, where the two, where the native and non-native populations come into contact. So, so our sort of interpretation of that is, if they get into sort of a, a place where fox density is low and it's kind of no no person's land, uh, then they're they're going to potentially mate with any red fox they come into contact with. Okay. Um, I don't want to say too much more about the non-native foxes, uh, but I, I did want to mention that because uh, it's a source of a lot of confusion about red foxes in California. Uh, so now I want to focus on the two native ones, uh, the Sacramento Valley red fox and the, and the Sierra Nevada red fox. And, and I want to point out that although they're both native, they really are different, not just based on the habitats they use, but uh, in some other characters as well. Um, including uh, their morphology, as I mentioned, the larger size of the Sacramento Valley red fox. The one thing that is most obvious in these pictures, however, is not a real difference. So in this case, the Sierra Nevada red fox on the right is, has a black color morph, and there are actually three color morphs that we find in North American red foxes. Black, cross, and cross does not mean hybrid of anything. It's, it just has a cross on its back. It's orange with a black cross on its back and red. And although today in the Sacramento Valley, to my knowledge, all we have is red pelaged foxes, historically that was not the case. Uh, there were cross and black red foxes in the Sacramento Valley as well. Um, 
even in the Sierra Nevada, it depends where you look, we have, two, I may be jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, we have a population in Lassen, which are all just red also. And then we have a second population a little north of Yosemite, where we get all three color morphs. And this is just, again, the comparison between showing the larger body size of Sacramento Valley red foxes compared to Sierra Nevada red foxes. And this was a, a sort of fortuitous uh, January. Uh, we were able to collect within a week of each other, I think, excuse me, uh, a roadkill of a Sacramento Valley red fox in January and a Sierra Nevada red fox uh, that was unfortunately hit on 395 um, in January of 2011. And you can see a huge difference between how haired the bottom of the feet are of the Sierra Nevada red fox on the right compared to the Sac Valley red fox on the left, and uh, you know that that would seem to be on the right, uh, and you know the amount of hair on the foot and adaptation to uh, snow. They have much more surface area on the bottom bottom of their feet, smaller body size, which really helps with foot loading. Sort of the same principle as a Canadian lynx, so they're more able to presumably uh, run on top of uh, snow. And I don't suppose it hurts to uh, insulate the foot a little too. Okay, so what about the population trends and status? Um, well, it's been known for a long time uh, that the Sierra Nevada red fox in California has, uh, has really plummeted from its historical numbers um, in the mid part of the uh, 20th century. Um, and uh, Sacramento Valley, less clear. For one thing, we didn't even know they were native, so nobody paid much attention uh, until very recently. Uh, but also, as you could see from those previous slides where I showed where we had the samples, as best we don't really know what their historic, the extent of their historical range was, but from as best we can reconstruct it, the range hasn't necessarily changed in any kind of measurable way. Uh, we have lost, the habitat has changed uh, tremendously, and we've lost riparian and we've lost grasslands. Um, so potentially there could be uh, lower abundance, but you can't tell that without looking at some indirect uh, estimators. And so uh, for that, um, genetic diversity is kind of one of the, one of the nice tools. And uh, I'm going to show you first mitochondrial genetic diversity. Uh, mitochondrial genetic diversity uh, is lost much more rapidly than nuclear genetic diversity, so it's a more sensitive uh, way to detect when a population has declined uh, than, than nuclear genetic diversity. But ultimately, it's the nuclear genetic diversity that really matters to the fitness of the animal, so you want to look at that as well. And this just shows uh, a precipitous declines. Here the light blue in all four populations are historical, and the darker blue is modern samples, and, and we found, um, you know, strong declines in the genetic diversity in the Sierra Nevada red foxes and in the Sacramento Valley red foxes, uh, and not quite as much in the Rocky Mountains. And also we have no evidence that the Rocky Mountain red foxes um, have had any kind of a, of a uh, decline. We look at the nuclear genetic diversity, we see more or less qualitatively the same pattern. Um, as you can see, the Southern Cascades, Sierra Nevada, uh, a pretty big, de that's a big decline for nuclear genetic diversity. And that, that's consistent with what we already know about, about the magnitude of the decline just from demogra demographic uh, indicators. Uh, at the lower right, the Sacramento Valley, though, if you look, um, it's not nearly as big a decline, although it is a statistically significant decline, and we've been able to estimate um, the size of the genetic effect of population size. And it definitely went through a bottleneck in the last century. They declined significantly from their historical numbers. Um, and we've estimated the genetic effect of population size at right around 50. And so what that means is from a genetic point of view, it's the equivalent of having 50 breeding individuals as your entire population. And that's not good. But, uh, but it also doesn't necessarily mean that we literally have 50 individuals, and in fact, we know that not to be the case. So now I'm going to kind of turn my attention to just the Sacramento Valley red fox, and we'll return to the Sierra Nevada red foxes a bit, bit later. Okay, so 
One of the, the, the first questions we had about the Sacramento Valley Red Fox when we figured out that it was native is, well, how many are there and are they, you know, should we be concerned? And we still don't have the answer to that, uh, but we've been sort of attacking it with, uh, with an approach uh, that's had two phases, and I'm going to refer to uh, phase one. This was research that was uh, conducted in uh, 2007 through 2009 uh, uh, to, to basically, well, there were a number of objectives, but one of them was to document the distribution, and the other was to figure out the, uh, the habitat associations so that we could use it to come up with a species distribution model. Uh, the sort of second phase, which we're currently doing right now, that's kind of underway, is to use this uh, species distribution model as a basis to do occupancy surveys in the areas where these red foxes are predicted to be. Uh, and then sort of in principle, the idea is that if you know the proportion of, uh, of the range or the, the area of habitat where they quote unquote should be, and then you know what proportion of that habitat is occupied, then you can multiply those, divide by the average home range size, and you've got an estimate. Crude, yes, but right now we don't even have a crude estimate. So we have a, a crude estimate then of sort of the census population size of the Sacramento Valley Red Fox. Okay, so I want to now just tell you a little bit about phase one. Okay, so this um, this was uh, a uh, this was um, actually both of the phases of this were were uh, primarily funded by uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and uh, I see Armin Gonzalez in the audience here was uh, a main facilitator that that got us going on on this. And, allowed us to do this work. And the approach was, we've got an awfully large area to try to cover, to, to find these foxes, uh, you know, it's uh, from, from Redding down to, uh, you know, down to the bay um, and then across. So how do you do that? And so our thought was, well, there's no way to do some kind of a, you know, unbiased survey of this entire area. So let's just find all the foxes we can, however we can. And so our thought was, Let's, broad, let's wait till the pup rearing season, uh, right about when pups are going to be emerging from dens. That's when pups are going to be visible, adults are going to be more diurnal, moving back and forth to dens, and people are not only most likely to see them, but we're most likely to go to where they said they saw them and have a good chance that if, in fact, they saw a red fox, there's going to be a den nearby. And then we can not only document presence, we can document reproduction. Um, so the first phase was basically just to get out the word, and we did this for four years in a row. And, uh, and, and in any one of these sort of uh, uh, articles, we would give the website for this reporting website, and people could report um, sightings or, or road kills. And then we could afterwards go out and investigate. And if we were lucky, we'd find this kind of evidence, uh, which was sort of definitive evidence of reproduction. We'd find pups or or a den site. Uh, in some cases, we'd find a road kill. Sometimes, if it was a pup, again, we could document reproduction because at that age, they're not going to be far from a den. Uh, if it was an adult, not reproduction, but still, still uh, useful. And it shows. Uh, this shows uh, here uh, in that, at least for three years of that uh, study, all of the the den sites that were confirmed in red and then the road kills in blue. So we got a pretty good distribution, although you can tell if every one of those is, I think there were over 50 reproductive den sites. So already the, uh, the idea that there's only 50 breeding red foxes is kind of out the window. So then the next thing you can do is sort of overlay that on a vegetation layer. And without doing anything very fancy or statistical, it doesn't take too much imagination to look at this and see some patterns. So in this case, the yellow is grassland, and the orange and sort of lighter tan are various upland uh, dryland agriculture. And then the, uh, the sort of bluish green and purple are all either, uh, mostly it's, it's, agri it's uh, 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 flooded agriculture or seasonally flooded agriculture. Uh, some of it is actual wetlands, uh, natural wet, well, managed wetlands. Uh, and uh, 
and so what you can see is they they appear to avoid the wetlands, and that's you know that's not a great surprise. Uh, they they den the terrain, uh, you know, under under the ground. So if it's flooded, they can't really den there. Um, but when we do it, look at this a little bit more quantitatively, we get a strong, significant avoidance of flooded agriculture, and actually a, a strong affinity for grasslands. Okay, so we can take all of that information and basically put it into a model, and this is sort of one of our models. This is our, our sort of simplest, uh, most broad brush model. Uh, it's not a very sophisticated model, uh, and it's probably not a very accurate model, but it already, uh, here in this case, the red is the predicted uh, fox presence, and the blue is sort of a predicted non-presence, and then it's kind of a gradient. Um, uh, it, even that sort of uh, uh, reduces the amount of area that we would search for foxes in by quite a bit. Um, if we incorporate other variables that we know to be important, such as uh, escape cover from coyotes, uh, which is where we find most of these dens in areas where there's some kind of protection from coyotes, so we don't find them out in Beale Air Force Base, despite all of the uh, grasslands, uh, because presumably because there's no way to get away from the coyotes, and the coyotes dominate that habitat. Um, so edges of grasslands uh, near human human construction and things like that. Um, so this is maybe a maybe a better model. In any case, we we um, that's kind of uh, the far that's how far we got with phase one in terms of trying to get a handle on the numbers. We still we still don't have any idea at the end of this what extent of where the model says there could be foxes. Are there, in fact, foxes? Okay, so that brings us to phase two, um, which we're doing right now. Um, and that, that effort's uh, sort of uh, being led right now by uh, Kat Miles, who's a master's student of mine, shown here in this picture. And this also is uh, being uh, supported by the Department of Fish and, uh, Fish and Wildlife, as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and uh, what we did is we sort of stratified the area based on the model into sort of predicted uh, high prediction, low prediction, medium, that sort of thing. And then within each of these strata, we randomly sampled grid cells or hexes uh, that we would sample. And this is a really obvious, simple study design, and, and there's nothing at all tricky to doing this kind of a, of a study until you get to, until you factor in the fact that uh, I don't know what the percentage is, but it must be upwards of 98% of the Sacramento Valley Red Fox range is private property. So, uh, so you can't just pick a cell and say, I'm going to go out there and survey. The next step becomes sort of the limiting, uh, the limiting step in the equation, which is then you've got to go out and seek permission in these uh, randomly selected places. And of course, it, it eats away at, at how random you are when you have to discard this one and pick another random one. Uh, but uh, I, I think we've been getting it about half or something like that, which isn't too bad. Um, once, once you sort of have randomly chosen a, a cell, then, then the idea is to go survey it. And we've used two approaches. One is to use baited camera surveys, same kind of thing that's uh, done on forest carnivores. Um, and then a second is foot searches for scats, which we found to be uh, especially in, in uh, warmer times of the year, in summer, uh, much more efficient for documenting species present. You can collect a lot of carnivore scats and then get the DNA and determine species from the mitochondrial DNA. Okay, so this just shows a map of the model again, um, and these black grid uh, hexes are the randomly selected ones. Um, many of them, well, not many, some of them have been surveyed, some We've gotten permission to survey, but haven't surveyed yet, and some we're going to have to substitute out. Uh, you'll notice a couple clusters that don't look random. One of those, the one right above the Setter Buttes in the center there, is Gray Lodge. We've, we're sort of making an extra effort to, uh, to survey the uh, fish and game lands, or sorry, fish and wildlife lands that are in the, in the range. And this is just showing, this is Preston Alden, uh, another one of my students who's been helping Kat with this project. Um, setting up one of our typical stations. He's putting in a camera on one side of the road, and on the other side you can see uh, there's some chicken uh, and, and some chicken wire attached to a tree. And then 
Uh, below that are, are basically uh, rifle cleaning bore brushes that are there to, to snag hair from uh, any would-be uh, attacker of the chicken. Um, and so we get photograph and potentially genetic data if they go up to it. We like to put them across roadways and trails because a lot of times, especially foxes, tend to be real shy about approaching the bait. And they may come down, but they may not get close enough. Uh, so we just, if they're going to walk by, we want to be able to get a detection. Here's an example of a detection from a couple months ago. Um, and that's, this is a place where there were no trees, so uh, I think actually this might have been Karen Converse's idea to use, uh, to use these uh, kind of stakes to put up the bait. And sometimes the foxes will go to great lengths to get at the bait. Yeah, so everybody knows red foxes can't climb trees, right? Only gray foxes climb trees, except when red foxes climb trees. And I think you'll see another uh, tree climbing red fox a little later in the talk. Um, okay, so the, we don't have a lot of data yet, uh, but, but the preliminary findings are that in three, three hexes where we, we actually chose them because we already knew there were foxes, we wanted sort of a positive control, uh, we detected foxes in all of those hexes. Uh, in four that were selected in where the model predicted there shouldn't be any foxes, hey, look at that, there weren't any. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is the part that was maybe a little bit surprising, which is that in seven of the randomly selected hexes where, where actually even the more rigorous model uh, predicted that, uh, that they would be, um, in six of those, we have not detected red. It doesn't mean they're not there, but uh, we have to obviously estimate detection probabilities and all that sort of thing. But uh, but that's sort of a, a hint that um, we we may not, you know, we may not, we may be right in the middle. We can't say there's 50 foxes, and we can't say that every area of predicted habitat has foxes. It means we have to work a lot harder to figure out where these foxes are and how many we have. Okay, so now I want to uh, transition over to the Sierra Nevada red fox, which is our most endangered uh, red fox in California. And I think I may have mentioned before these, uh, the Sierra Nevada red fox was listed as threatened under the uh, California Endangered Species Act in 1980 and uh, was petitioned for listing under the U.S. Endangered Species Act in 2011, and that's, uh, that's still pending a decision, I think, due out a year from now. Um, so. Why did Sierra Nevada red foxes decline in the first place? And the answer is we have, we have no idea. Um, some guesses, trapping, over-trapping. Uh, there's some thoughts that they weren't super abundant in the first place, so maybe fur trapping in the early part of the century in the late 1800s uh, sort of tipped them over the uh, threshold. Uh, could be that uh, habitat transformations due to uh, you know, forestry practices, fire, uh, livestock grazing have changed the equation with respect to, there's always been coyotes in the Sierras and in the, in the uh, Cascades, so the Southern Cascades, but maybe there are more of them now. Um, prey declines, unfortunately we have very little baseline on what historical prey were like in the Sierras and the Southern Cascades, or of course the, uh, the uh, climate change, you know, and, and more, more than likely it's not any one of these but some combination. Uh, factors limiting recovery is sort of the more pressing issue, though, if we want, if we want, uh, if we want to care about recovery. And uh, presumably whatever caused the decline in the first place might still be in play, uh, but there may be additional factors that are limiting recovery that may not be the things that caused the decline in the first place. And really chief among these is inbreeding depression. Once a population gets very small, then they can, uh, due to having to breed with close relatives, this can cause uh, buildup of deleterious recessive homozygous alleles and other problems that can lead to low reproduction, low juvenile survival. And of course, the classic case of this that many of you are probably all of you are familiar with would be the Florida panther. Um, 
And, and so this could potentially be a real problem, so that even if you're able to figure out what caused the decline in the first place and solve it, uh, if there's some sort of uh, inbreeding depression going on, it may not be just a simple matter to, uh, to fix the ecological issues. Uh, I just want to kind of uh, point out uh, for folks that are interested, I'm not going to go through these, but uh, these are some, a couple of uh, really great resources uh, just on background on conservation issues with Sierra Nevada red foxes. Uh, the one on the left was written by John Perine and colleagues, and, and this is really a nice compilation of, of, a, of a lot of information. Uh, there are some parts of it that are now outdated, even though it was finally published in 2010, um, but really, really good resource. And then the listing position, petition by the uh, Center for Biological Diversity. Um, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily agree with everything in it, but again, a really good uh, resource and, and a lot of a lot of good, uh, good reasoning and information in that as well. Okay, so uh, this this is uh, Joseph Grinnell's range map um, from his book in 1937, um, and you can ignore the one in the middle. That's the Sac Valley red fox. But even historically, the Sierra Nevada red fox was already a fragmented population. Uh, there were apparently, at least according to Joseph Grinnell, and as best we could sort of uh, reconstruct from trappers records, three distinct. Uh, populations, one close to Mount Shasta, one around Mount Lassen, and then one throughout the Sierra Nevada proper. Um, pretty much after red foxes were listed as threatened in 1980, they seemed to have kind of dropped off the radar screen and nobody paid much attention to them until uh, Tom Cusera accidentally uh, photographed a Sierra Nevada red fox in uh, Lassen National Park in 1993, and this was during uh, some mustelid surveys. Um, and that actually sort of precipitated a lot of excitement. Not that anybody necessarily thought they were gone, but it sort of reminded us, uh, hey, we're still here. Uh, and uh, so that, so, so Tom and, uh, and then later John Perrine kind of got together and decided, well, let's uh, do a telemetry study. And, uh, and I have to say, um, knowing what I know now about how difficult these foxes are to catch, uh, a lot more difficult than Sac Valley red foxes. Um, John had five red foxes collared, which, you know, at the time I thought, come on, you, you can't learn anything from that. But uh, five actually now seems like quite a feat. Uh, uh, they're not easy to catch. Um, anyway, one of the important things we learned uh, from John's study, he had four females, all adults and a male, and they were monitored for anywhere from two to three years each, none of them reproduced. And I necropsied a couple of the females, so it wasn't just that he didn't find them reproducing, but these were females that uh, one was five years old and had never had a litter of pups. So that's not common with red foxes, at least from what we know about red fox biology, which is not from these foxes themselves. So. We've never known really how to interpret that. Um, we had a lot of ideas, and I'll come back to those. Um, but that was sort of an important piece of information. Then since 2007, Pete Figuera um, with the Department of Fish and Wildlife has, uh, has been um, monitoring these foxes annually with both uh, baited camera surveys, hair snares, and we've been working with them on the genetics of that, um, and foot searches for scats. Um, and, and that's been really useful. We've got 2007, yeah, seven years now of, of data on, on the same group of these foxes. Um, they are now trying to catch and radio collar these foxes uh, and having as much difficulty as we are. Um, in 2010, uh, and I, I should mention before 2010, uh, although nobody entirely wrote off the the other populations of red fox, and we're still looking around Mount Shasta too. Um, you know, the longer you go without anybody being able to verify uh, the presence, the sort of less optimistic you are. Um, and so we were sort of thinking it was possible that maybe there were no more Sierra Nevada red foxes outside of Lassen. And then the Forest Service during uh, Adam Adam Rich and Sherry Licious, two different uh, uh, forests actually, right where they meet, were doing a joint. Um, uh, camera survey, and they documented this thing, which uh, I got this in my email, 
and uh, Sherry sent it, and she said, look, um, I don't want to sound like an alarmist, and, you know, I know this is a terrible picture, but we pretty much ruled out everything it could be except for a red fox. What do you think? And, you know, I, of course, sent it to, you know, everybody I know, and uh, John and Esther and Keith Aubrey, and, and, you know, we all sort of agree. I mean, when we look at it, there's not too many other things it can be, and it sure looks like a bad picture of a red fox. So, uh, so um, I said uh, uh, to Sherry, I said, well, shoot, do, you know, could you get any hair off the bark? And she said, well, we looked, and, you know, we searched, and we searched, and we got one. I said, save it, protect it. I said, uh, I, I said, what else do you have? Oh, I think she sent us the hair, and I, no, she said, she said, uh, I said, you know, I don't know if we're going to be able to figure it out from that hair. She goes, uh, nothing, nothing. And then she said, sort of an afterthought, she goes, you know, she was actually talking about, I said, well, so how'd you bait it? I didn't see the bait there. And she goes, well, we put this piece of chicken in a, in a sock. I said, well, did, did it go for the bait at all? Oh, yeah, it chewed that sock up. I said, where's that sock? She said, I, I threw it in a dumpster. Should, should I go get it? I said, yeah, I get it. She, she sent it next day. She got it. Luckily, the trash had not been picked up. Senate next day air and uh, Mark Mark Statham uh, worked his magic in, in my lab. There's the sock. Was able to get the DNA and um, it turned out actually it was very definitively red fox. Um, but then of course our next question was okay, it's red fox, but maybe it was a non-native one that just kind of was wandering through or something. So the next thing was we had to use the nuclear DNA. And we had to compare it to our database of genetic data from all those museum samples and modern samples I showed you before. And lo and behold, we got an exact match. And I won't even go into what these bars mean because we all understand colors, right? Yellow equals yellow. So the yellow are the, um, the uh, genetic signature of the Sierra Nevada red fox from our historical museum samples and the Sonora Pass individuals uh, by then, we actually, I think, well, no, it's just the one, uh, you know, match perfectly. And uh, not, we, we, you can't see it here, but we also compared it to our non-native and uh, Sac Valley and a bunch of others, everything else we had. And no question, perfect match, this was native Sierra Nevada Red Fox. But as you can imagine, um, you know, once, once you start, you know, people see something like the excitement of rediscovery of something we thought might have been extirpated, then a lot of people start thinking pretty quick, I like snowmobiling there, and I don't like what this is going to mean. You know, next thing you know, they'll be calling it an endangered species, and we won't be able to, you know. So then there's a lot of challenges. So um, that, of course, precipitated um, a, a flurry of activity from uh, Forest Service, from Cal Fish and Wildlife, Chris Sturmer. Uh, in particular, um, uh, and us from UC Davis, uh, and we and and volunteers. Uh, there's a group, Sea Cirque, that volunteer that were real helpful, just combing the area for scats. Uh, Adam and Sherry put up lots more cameras, and it didn't take long before, even without the genetics, just from the photographic evidence, we can see we clearly had multiple individuals, and so this wasn't a fluke. We had we had actually a population here, and we ended up you know, confirming through genetic samples that these guys were all native too and, uh, and, and uh, very low genetic diversity. So uh, very, very consistent with the fact that they'd been here all along. We simply hadn't noticed them. So uh, a number of uh, people and agencies got together in response to this and we formed this, this sort of ad hoc Southern Sierra Nevada Red Fox Working Group. Um, and we sort of initiated two major efforts. And the first of these was a broad survey, and that was read, led by uh, Chris Sturmer of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And the, the aim there was, hey, let's get up these baited camera surveys, not near where we all want to look, because we already know they're there, but up, up and down the Sierra Crest from these, and let's, let's see if we can find more. If they're here, there may be others. Um, and so that's been uh, really important. Um, I think they're taking a break, but I hope that that continues. 
because I don't think those surveys have really begun to scratch the surface. Um, but real important effort. And then the second has been a focal study to look more at the ecology of this rediscovered population. And Esther Burkett's been real important uh, uh, in getting uh, fish and wildlife support for that research, um, as have Forest Service, both uh, Humboldt, Toyabe, and, uh, and the Spanish uh, Pacific Southwest region. Um, and so our, you know, our kind of main objectives in, in this research have been really just to get a basic handle on the size, extent, and the status of this population, what are the limiting factors, um, what are the threats, uh, and in particular, uh, the Forest Service is especially interested in us uh, look at two major uses of that area in, in, in the, where this population is, is it's a major snowmobile recreation area, uh, so it draws a lot of people there in the winter, uh, and one of the concerns is whether all the compaction from snowmobiling may make uh, some of the uh, deeper snow a little more easy for coyotes to navigate around and potentially um, bring coyotes in, which could cause problems with foxes. And then it's also a marine training, um, uh, uh, the marine training centers at the bottom of the hill there, and they, they do their training on the Forest Service land there. So these are all, all uh, questions of interest. And shown here is, and I, is, is uh, Kate Quinn, who's a PhD student who's uh, currently leading uh, this study, and um, she's holding that is not a red fox, that is a gray fox. I just want to make that clear. I labeled it. Um, but, you know, we catch what we can. Uh, okay, so uh, the, the methods that, so now I'm just, t I'm not going to talk about the broad survey here. I'm just focusing in on our kind of focal study of this Sonora Pass population. Um, really, two principal approaches. One is telemetry, uh, and that's you know the, the idea of using satellite collars and then eventually GPS collars to get more high-resolution data, um, and then a non-invasive study. And the, there are a lot of questions that we really do need the telemetry data for, especially in looking at sort of the um, specifics of habitat use, foraging ecology, how they're relating to snowmobile activities, marine training exercises, things like that, um, as well as dispersal. If, they, if they're going to other places where there are other red fox populations we haven't found, we'd like them to take us there. Um, but as you will see, uh, so far, the non-invasive genetic um, aspect of the study has really, uh, to this point, from for the last four years, given us all the data we have. Um, and, and that's, I'll talk more about that when we get there. But first, let me dispense with our telemetry study, because that'll be quick and easy. It's really just kind of like uh, uh, cute album pictures. Um, so this is, uh, this is kind of a, I, I, I should mention, you, you know, we've had, uh, it's taken a while to get the funding. It's taken a while to get the permits. It's taken a while to get a lot of things logistically off the ground. So we only started trapping for really our we just done our first season this past winter, um, and I shouldn't say we, I should say Kate and, and David have really had their first season, um, and they've, uh, they've used uh, a couple different kinds of traps. This, this one on the left was built by uh, Kate. She built a bunch of these, and they're modeled after ones that were built by uh, Pete Figura and Rich Callis. Um, they're using these up at Lassen, and I think they modeled it after ones used by Keith Van Etten up in Montana. So um, these ones on the lower right, just your standard tomahawk trap, and that's, that's what John Perrine used. And we have a third, a larger tomahawk we're also using. All right, well, as I mentioned, these are really skittish animals. We, uh, we, we pre-baited the areas actually for a couple of months before we even put traps out. And then we left traps out just locked closed for another month after that. And we wanted to make sure the bears were all you know, put away for the winter before we, we started uh, uh, trapping. And then in, in uh, mid-January, early January, um, we actually opened the traps, but we locked them open and we baited them and we tried, spent a couple weeks trying to, hoping we could entice the foxes into the traps. Well, this one's sniffing. We would uh, rub deer carcass roadkill uh, around the front of the traps and that's what this fox is sniffing. But that, this trap was up there for, I think, two and a half weeks and we had 10 out. And we know these foxes visit, you know, our scent marks pretty regularly. But they didn't want to come around these 
trap. This is a sort of the first one finally coming around. Um, then we had this happen several times. Martins are a lot faster than red foxes, apparently. So here's a here's a view of uh, um, one where you know the, the the martin got there first and is looking out of the trap. And uh, this is when we were actually trying to trap. Uh, a little bit later, uh, this is just another one, just showing that both traps work on martins. Uh, and uh, you know, and uh, here's yet another one, another site, another fox. Uh, I think this is actually, oh no, I, I haven't gotten to that part of my story. Yeah, just another fox, uh, kind of sniffing around, never went in. Okay, now this is one we really wanted to catch because we think this is a native female that we've been monitoring for a long time. Uh, she came, this is in the morning. This is that same evening. Okay, I want you to look close at the snow in front of the trap and at the door of the trap. This is 12 hours later. Okay, that fox did not stay there 12 hours. The fox left and came back. I'm going to go back. You see, two things should, you should notice moving. Okay. Door won't close. Well, door partly closed. This fox went in that trap and tripped the door. What we have, we have trap transmitters. And the way these trap transmitters, they, they're great because you don't have to walk up to the trap and disturb, get your scent all over the site. You can stand back, you know, half a mile and use your antenna. And when the trap pulls up, there's a magnet that gets pulled out of a magnet holder, and then the transmitter changes its pulse rate. So you know when the door's closed because you can hear it. Well, this time, and this is it, we. This wasn't the first time this has happened. This has been a problem. We just haven't figured out how to solve. The, the trap transmitter magnet froze into the receptacle, and there's some play in the cable. So the door went down a little bit, but the actual cable holding the trap magnet to the door stayed on. So uh, unfortunately, that was a mixed capture. You can see the snow. This thing obviously bounded out of the trap. You know, so. That, that was the bad news. We scared the heck out of this animal. And, you know, one of the biggest concerns when you have so few animals is, did we just meet, did we just make it so we're never going to catch this animal? Well, the good news is she came back 12 hours later, started sniffing around. This is the same trap yet again 12 hours. She, she just kept coming back. This is the same day as this. Door's still at half mast. She's in the trap. So at least we didn't we didn't uh, we didn't uh, mess her up for good. The other thing is, uh, both Kate and Dave had uh, we could do this for 10 days and then they need to have some time off. And normally they would have changed their plans at this point, but there were plans that couldn't be changed, so they had to go and lock up all the things. They kept the cameras on it. This box for the next four days, no, you know, the, the traps were baited and left open, and this box went into that trap several times. But you know, we didn't have it. So that it could be caught, uh, and then that was that was sort of it. And then that fox didn't come around anymore. Uh, had eaten enough for the winter, I guess. Okay, so so what are we going to do next year? Well, I actually think we had enough close calls that I, I have a feeling that these foxes all got to know our traps pretty well, and they did. Even though it took them two months, they got more and more comfortable. So I'm hoping we're going to do better this year. But we also may add some uh, log cabin traps. Uh, these, these are, were designed uh, by Jeff Copeland for wolverines, uh, but they get, in the northern Rockies, when they're trying to trap wolverines, they get their biggest, like our martins are red foxes they're constantly. So, uh, and there's, a, there's a, a guy, Patrick Cross, out there now who's, who's built a bunch of these. And I think in two and a half months, he trapped and radio collared eight of them during pretty much the same period we were trapping and catching nothing. So, so we may mix things up a little bit. Okay, well that that was fun storytelling, but um, now I got to get back to the some of the data, and that all comes from the non-invasive genetic monitoring. Okay, so just to kind of review uh, or uh, go through my the, our methods here, um, we've used sort of relied on three sources of DNA: hair, most of which comes from baited snaggers like the ones you saw near the cameras, uh, scats, which is probably our best source. And those are from just foot searches. And scat dogs would be fantastic. We just don't have the funding for that right now, uh, maybe in the future. 
uh, and urine, urine during uh, snow tracking. Uh, so this is where the DNA sources are coming from. Um, and then what do we do with the DNA? Well, we can do a number of things. We use the mitochondrial DNA first just to identify species. And I think we pick up all carnivore scats, so we can also monitor coyotes uh, and, and individually identify coyotes as well. Um, we know who the residents are, who's just passing through. Martins, actually, we, did, we get more from hair on martins uh, and other mesocarnivores in the area. Um, and um, so in addition to species, we can figure out if they happen to be a red fox, we can identify at least first first swipe at identifying a native versus a non-native red fox. At least a non-native versus a non-native a native versus a non-native haplotype. And then we use nuclear microsatellites and sex markers to identify. Uh, to, well, first we compare them to our population database, kind of like I showed you, just to sort of figure out: are, the, are is this another native fox, or is there something else going on? Um, uh, hybrid whatever. Uh, we look at, at figure out whether it's a male or a female, and we can, I should have wrote, oh yeah, individual identity uh, so that we can get repeated locations and we can geo-reference them and put them on a map just like a radio telemetry location. Um, and uh, familiar relationships, we can figure out, you know, we can reconstruct pedigrees and figure out who's mom and dad, who are their offspring, if they have any, uh, who's new to the study area, who's not being found anymore, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, so the, that's what we're looking for. We're trying to reconstruct individual timelines, which give us a sense of longevity uh, and sort of an indication of adult survival, adult survivorship. Uh, we can get an idea of sort of birth, birth rates, immigration, um, and some sense of home ranges. Okay, so this is this is three years out of date, and I'm doing this on purpose. I kind of want to build a little bit of a story here. So this is a slide from a talk I gave three years ago, and this is all we had. Uh, let me just explain. The next several slides are going to show some version of this graph. So across the uh, x-axis is a timeline. It's just dates. Um, the dashed lines, vertical lines, are the time of year when pups would emerge, and so pups would be potentially detectable by us. Uh, and they do only breed once a year, and they breed synchronized, so that all pups are born at the same time of year. Um, the black, the black dots are actual genetic samples, and the lines that they fall on are the individual whose genotype those genetic samples belong to. So, for example, if you look at the bottom line, that's oh, and the colors are yellow is males and red is females, and uh, in, in the bottom. Uh, this F210-7, this is that cross female that I showed you entering our trap. Um, we, uh, we know now uh, that she is the mother of two of the first foxes we got, and this uh, yellow male is the father, and then the two daughters uh, were uh, F2010-6, who's also the one you saw in the tree in that poor shot who ate the bait sock. Uh, and the first one detected, she was one of the daughters. And, um, and then F2011-2, she's the uh, black or silver morph daughter. And 2011-3 here is, uh, we only sampled this individual once, and it was right near where we got our only photo of a pup that year. Uh, that's a pup uh, in the picture. But we never got it again, so we don't know whether that, uh, what happened to that pup. Um, a little early to disperse, but and then there's uh, that's sort of the main, most accessible part of the study area, and that's where we feel like we have really good coverage, and that if there are individuals there, we know about it. Um, we also backpack uh, into the uh, wilderness areas uh, to the northern boundary of Yosemite, and it takes a little bit more effort to get back there, so we can't do it as often, and we don't have as much data, so we don't think we know everybody that's there. Um, but we did get one male um, back there, very close to the Yosemite boundary. And there was a road, that roadkill I mentioned before that you saw her foot. Um, she was killed on 395, but she assigns to be a very close relative of this male that we sampled near the Yosemite boundary. So we think she was dispersing from that area or kind of, you know, trying to. All right, well, if we go another year, so this is now up to date two years ago, 
uh, you can see uh, we, we've got pretty good longevity. We're still sampling many of the same adults that we know were there from the beginning. Um, and the only other individual we got back in that remote area was the same male, so he's still around. But we also got three new individuals. And uh, I'm going to, so this F212-3, the female, she's native, clear native, um, but not related to the family group in that area. So she presumably came from either Yosemite or close to Yosemite. And then these two new males. Now, I'm going to come back to those two new males. I'm just going to tell you right now, those two males both had non-native haplotypes. And um, that's just the mitochondrial, but um, that's weird. And they weren't even the same non-native haplotype. So that, that was very strange. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to come back to that. But, but before I do, I want to sort of interpret what do, we, what do we get from at least the native ones here can we learn anything with so small a number of individuals about their demography? And I think we can. Uh, the adults live a long time. I wouldn't put a number on it from these data, um, but there's no reason to suspect that adult survival is at all a problem in this population. What we did notice, however, uh, was that there were very few offspring. We only documented one for sure in 2011, none in 2012. Doesn't mean nobody bred, but we didn't document any new ones. Um, th that could have been born from, from that, from any of the known individuals. So looks like reproduction could be a potential problem, or it could be neonatal survival. I mean, we wouldn't know, but recruitment in any case seems to be a problem. And that's real similar to what John Perrine, you know, to what I was saying about John Perrine's telemetry study and the low reproduction. Um, and since then, that's also consistent with what Pete Figura has found uh, in monitoring Lassen for the last seven years. We still, every year, we get the same individuals we got four, five, six years ago. So they're long-lived foxes, but we don't get very many. We get some, but we don't get very many offspring. So, um, you know, one of our biggest concerns is that these populations are inbred and suffering from inbreeding depression, and that may be a really important factor limiting their ability to, uh, to recover. Of course, we can't rule out other things like nutrition. I mean, it could just be their prey base is so bad. Reproduction, canid reproduction is tied to nutrition. So we, you know, we can't jump to the conclusion necessarily that it's inbreeding depression, but that's certainly one of our, um, our, our best guesses. All right, let's go back to those two males with the non-native haplotypes. I got away once without having to explain what these are and just to use color, so I'm hopefully going to be able to do that again. These are nuclear DNA genetic assignments, and this time I'm showing you um, on the bottom are the Sonora Pass individuals and all of the ones that say C34, that's, the, that's a native Sonora Pass haplotype, all have red bars. This, I, sorry, I changed up the colors. In this case, the red bars are matching, as you can see from the above graph, the historical Sierra Nevada. So like I said, they all agree, they're all native, there's no question. Uh, the two males with the non-native haplotypes, G38 and O24, clearly are not from uh, there. Um, I, I didn't show it, but I can also tell you they're not even related to one another. So they're two completely unrelated males. They don't even assign to the same population. Um, and they're not related to each other, and they showed up in the summer. That's not even when fox disperse. Foxes usually disperse in the winter. Um, so if we were going to get long distance dispersals from somewhere like Utah or Nevada, uh, we, would, we would think that that would be much more likely in the fall or winter. Anyway, we still don't know how they got there, but they're not native. Uh, this is just sort of another more rigorous way of asking uh, the population assignment question a little bit differently, and I'm not going to go through all of it, except to say that all of these stars mean you're rejecting the possibility the reasonable possibility that uh, that a genotype came from one of these populations. So the first seven individuals, the first seven rows, are again the native animals we've been monitoring, and the far right column, those are p-values. So uh, they're all they're all non-significant, which means that's the only population they can't be rejected from. They're from that population and none of the others. The two non-native males are on the bottom. 
And the only population that we had data from, and that's an important qualification, you have to have reference data from the population that it came from to be able to assign them. We, we may not have had them, but what we can say is that the, the only ones we couldn't strongly reject as a possibility were Nevada red foxes. And Nevada red foxes are the topic of a whole other talk that hopefully Preston Alden will give you in a few years from now, but that's one complicated story, and it's not a simple matter of native, non-native. Uh, but some important things we can rule out. These animals did not come from California non-native populations. So they didn't come from the valley, all those ones that Jeff Lewis documented expanding from these fur farm escapees. That's not these guys. So they came from, from the east. Whether somebody drove them up there and dropped them off or whether they got up there on their own, we really don't know. But what matters to us is what's going to happen with these foxes. Well, the first thing we noticed, and now I'm going a year and a half back to the talk I gave a year and a half before we knew the answer to what was going to happen, and this is just my slides about worrying about what's going to happen. And these are, I deliberately, since this is going to get posted on the web, I didn't want to give exact point locations, but there's a bunch of points, and I, I'm just showing you the polygons that are home ranges of four foxes. And so the gray one up top and the pink one on the bottom are the two native females and uh, this green one up top and the blue one on the bottom are the two non-native males, all the different genetic samples we have and sort of our idea of their home range. So it doesn't take too much imagination to see that it looks like they could be pairing up with these native females. And so we were really concerned, well, we were hoping that potentially these males would, uh, and you, you know, I realize I haven't explained why we would hope this, but I can uh, get to that. Uh, we were hoping that perhaps these males would just not survive or would keep on their way and leave and uh, do no harm, but we didn't think that was likely given what we saw in terms of their space use relative to these two females. Uh, we were also concerned about competition with the one breeding male we had in that area that was native, and in fact he did disappear. Uh, uh, you know, we've not sampled him since these guys arrived. And mostly we were worried about non-native hybridization and introgression. And um, I sort of went back and forth with how much to get into this, and I decided not to get into it a lot, other than, and, and so feel free to ask me questions uh, afterwards. But um, basically uh, what we sort of predicted was if these, the population had been suffering from inbreeding depression, outbreeding with these non-native males would in the short term, well, it would be a test of that hypothesis, for one thing, because if suddenly we had offspring all over the place, that would be not definitive, but it would be support for the idea that inbreeding depression is an issue. Um, but we were also concerned that, uh, you know, uh, if that's the case, then very quickly the only two non-native males, and a male can breed with many females, and there are no native males right in that area, could very quickly swamp the native population with non-native uh, alleles. Before we really know, you could, you could get philosophical and say, well, does that matter as long as they're foxes? Um, and, and, and we're going to have to get philosophical. But, um, but we don't yet know that much about whether these native ones might have locally adapted uh, uh, aspects of them that, for example, these non-native ones are likely to be a lot larger. Is that going to, maybe in a good year like this one, no, not going to cause a problem. Maybe we get a really bad snow year. Maybe the maybe we're going to have bigger foxes that aren't going to do so well. Maybe that's all imagination. And the reality is, I just don't want to see native foxes get replaced by non-native ones. So um, that's uh, that's my personal subjective uh, feeling. But but let's see what happened. Okay. Well, the the first thing we noticed. So this is now as of a year and a half ago. Um, adding another year, and I'm sorry, the colors changed. Now blue is male. Females are still red, but the males are now blue. And uh, actually, this is a much more elegant slide because Kate made it, and she's much more artistic than me. Um, the green here are the two non-native males, and as you can see, they did survive the winter. Um, but the real question is, was there reproduction? And uh, the answer is yes. So now, was it their reproduction? I don't know. You'll have to wait to see to the next slide. But clearly, there were there were pups born. 
we've, we've now, that's the fourth year in a row, we've looked for pups and found no evidence, like, well, other than that one, of reproduction. And all of a sudden we have six. Six, six new offspring. Okay, well, it turns out when you do the pedigree, sure enough, uh, they are indeed uh, offspring, hybrid offspring of the native male and non-native, uh, native female and non-native male that uh, that we sort of anticipated. Uh, so those were the pairings that that led to successful reproduction. The other thing I'd point out in litter one here on the left, the male is red, the native female is that silver or black one, and these offspring, we did get photographs of those pups, are crossed. It doesn't mean a cross between a silver and a red, but it just so happens that um, that is consistent. That is one of the genotypes that is it can, you could also have two black foxes produce a cross fox. So, but the point is the offspring are consistent both based on the genetics and the morphology with these parental pairings. Okay, so uh, just to kind of reiterate what we have uh, so far with Sierra Nevada red foxes, there's a very small number of individuals in California. And uh, I didn't talk about Lassen much, but what we're finding uh, up there, what Pete's been getting, is it's a coin flip. I think maybe there are more individuals in the Lassen population than Sonora Pass, but I could just as easily be proven wrong in a year's time. So uh, they're, they're both pretty small, and I would be willing to bet there are fewer than 20 breeding individuals. And I don't mean the genetic effective population size, which also happens to be 20, 20. But in this case, our, our, our guess is probably that's actually also the, the true census population. Yeah, because those are the only populations we know of in California. Um, so, so that's our, our best guess. I'm hoping we're going to find more, and it'd be nice if Chris is able to, to uh, Chris Termer, start up the broader surveys, um, find that there are some others further south of this. Um, inbreeding depression is a big concern for us right now. Um, uh, genetic swamping because of this sort of uh, uh, unengineered experiment, which is not designed the way we would have designed it. I think that there are sources of translocation of mountain foxes, Sierra Nevada red foxes in particular, but even a, a Cascade or Rocky Mountain red fox would be preferable to that just taking sort of at least a non-native uh, compilation uh, you know, that's descended from 50 generations in fur farm captivity, uh, it'd be nice to at least control where we're getting the outbreeding. Um, one possibility is removing the non-native males. Um, that's obviously easier said than done, but, but it's, uh, it's something that uh, should be considered. Uh, translocation of other foxes, I think, is something that needs to be considered. Uh, but we can also do nothing. Uh, at least in terms of management, if we do nothing in terms of management, I think we really owe it to uh, this population and to to our science in general to really closely monitor this population, hope for the best and uh, learn from the worst. Basically, uh, this, if nothing else, presents uh, a tremendous opportunity to learn um, about this kind of thing, although I, I hope we can intervene and do, do better than just learn about it. But. That's that. Okay, so just to kind of, uh, I, I realize I've been pretty long-winded, so I'm going to quickly recap. Uh, Sacramento Valley and Sierra Nevada red foxes are both native and have both declined, the one much more than the other. Non-native red foxes have increased, although their encroachment on native red foxes, at least in the valley, appears to be minimal, might be more of a concern in the Sierra Nevada now. Um, the status of the Sacramento Valley red fox is still uncertain. Uh, we're working on that. We really don't know to what extent we need to be concerned about them. Sierra Nevada red foxes, we definitely need to be concerned about. They're extremely rare. Uh, they appear to be reproduction and recruitment limited. They were recently, at least in uh, the Sonora Pass area, uh, exposed to outbreeding from non-native ones, which in the short term uh, might, might affect some sort of a genetic rescue, um, but we're concerned might also end up in replacing native foxes with something different. Um, and our recommendations at this point, my recommendations, I'll own that, 
are uh, to continue the non-invasive genetic monitoring, try much harder to capture and collar uh, foxes, because I think it's really going to be critical not only to our ability to answer a lot of our questions, but to manage uh, the population. And uh, we really need to start now, we should have started before now, considering uh, and planning uh, translocation. And uh, I just want to say, uh, everything I've talked about, I have been but one uh, ingredient in the science, and some of it well, I had nothing to do with. I just uh, talked about it. Um, but um, th this is, uh, it's been really an honor to be involved and, and be at the center of this research, which has involved a, 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 more than are listed here, in fact, a number of, of collaborators and facilitators, many of you here in the audience and um, potentially uh, on the web. Um, students. Uh, have been kind of the workhorses of most of this, and I've starred them and put pictures of the graduate students. Uh, that's, uh, that one in the far lower right is Preston Alden, who is currently working on Nevada foxes in Oregon, Cascade red fox, well, Oregon, Sierra Nevada red fox. And that's him uh, crossing on a tightrope over to a Sierra Nevada red fox den. It's the only way we can get to them. So we have highly specialized students that work uh, on these projects. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's uh, and and then I've only listed here sort of the you know um, academic collaborators and uh, field collaborators, but here um, many many others um, have made uh, this work possible in a, in a whole variety of different ways. And I know for sure that I've left out names that I'm going to regret later because that always happens. And I really regret that this is going to be posted on the web for all to see for that reason. Um, and, and then the, the last thing I want to uh, say here at the bottom, many, many fantastic undergraduate interns and volunteers. We've literally had 60 or 70 undergraduates that have worked on uh, these projects. And I mean, really in the field and in the lab, and just absolutely um, dedicated, essential to all of the progress that's been made. And uh, so I. Thanks to all of them. And if my meter hasn't run out and you aren't all uh, sacked for not getting back to, to work on time, I'll, I'll take questions. So I'm just going to bring the microphone around if you have a question, and that's so that the people on WebEx can hear you. So uh, the slide that you had with the uh, SOC analysis results, SOC analysis, um, you made the point that yellow equals yellow, uh, and you're comparing the <coughs> Sierra Nevada red fox to okay. the to the to the sock mm -hmm. uh, fox. But it looked like um, for the Lassen population that it was blue and not yellow, and I was wondering if you could explain that. Okay, uh, I, just in case the mic isn't working, I'll repeat the question. The question was uh, that in this slide where the uh, Sonora Pass sock fox was assigned to the his historical Sierra Nevada, um, why was it not also assigned to the Lassen? Why is the Lassen uh, population showing up as blue? And um, there's two answers to that question. One is uh, historically, apparently, at least according to Joseph Grinnell, the Lassen population was distinct from the uh, Sierra Nevada. Um, I, I need to point out scale. So I guess I am going to, I'm not going to get away without being able to, I have to tell you what these bars uh, indicate. So these indicate estimates of the proportion of ancestry. So each vertical bar is a bar graph. So for example, you will notice there's uh, a couple in the center of the, the Lassen that have uh, that are maybe two thirds blue, or one of them is, and a third yellow, and that's sort of an estimate of saying, well, this fox is just based on the data is estimated to be to have two thirds of its ancestry from the Lassen population and a third from uh, from from the historical Sierra Nevada. You can't take those literally on a case by case, and I wouldn't actually interpret it this way that way. Um, that's just sort of the literal interpretation. But it's, um, 
they're population genetic indicators. So they're not like the mitochondrial DNA. They're not indicating uh, thousands of years of divergence. They're simply indicating how much gene flow there is uh, on a contemporary time scale. So uh, even historically, it appears that there was not likely, not that anybody did the, did the genetics. Well, we had a few samples from there, but not enough to look at it closely. Um, it appears that there was not a lot of gene flow between those populations. Historically, they were distinct um, in, in space, isolated geographically. And we know um, from the modern samples that because they're highly inbred, then they're going to cluster to themselves much more. And so they, they will actually become more distinct much more rapidly because they're a small population. So, so it, it isn't surprising at all that based on this analysis, the Lassen population is distinct from the Sierra Nevada. It's not an evolutionary um, scale. It's a population scale. Probably a, a longer answer. Than I've got two questions, so i got to figure out which one to go with. Um, you mentioned that Oregon population of the Sierra Nevada red fox, but that they didn't come into the, the talk very much. Is there anything you can add about them just shortly now? Yeah, so the, the question was about the Oregon Sierra Nevada red fox. Um, so we're in the process of trying to figure that out. Uh, what we what we know now is, is we've got, we have some uh, camera survey detections by Forest Service, some volunteer groups, uh, one of my students on Mount Hood. Um, that indicate that there are red foxes uh, in the Mount Hood area, Crater Lake. There's been a number of uh, photos. There was a um, summer intern that worked up there and photographed at least three different individuals. Um, and we got a couple genetic samples uh, sent from there. Um, there are four forests right now in Oregon that are uh, currently trying to get genetic samples. And next summer, actually, we're, we're going to to sort of coordinate that effort a little bit more. Um, the Right now we've gotten, uh, uh, I think, only two genetic samples that were of high enough quality. One was actually a road-killed fox from Crater Lake National Park uh, that we could actually subject to an assignment analysis. And uh, basically they, they also, at least you know, in, in the southern part of the Oregon, appear to be native too. Um, they're, and their their haplotypes are native. Their mitochondrial haplotypes are native. Um, but we don't have a critical mass. We need that. We can't get at allele frequencies because we don't. And even our historical data set from the Oregon Cascades is, is awful. We have very few historical samples. So, um, so I think we're gonna we're gonna we're not gonna be able to say too much more um, about. I mean, I guess the biggest question really is to what extent. Is there non? There, there are foxes in at least um, Crater Lake. Um, the um, oh, I'm forgetting my geography. Um, uh, the Three Sisters area. We've gotten photographs from uh, some of uh, Tim Hiller's and, uh, and and Jamie McFadden's surveys, um, and then Mount Hood. But whether there's sort of one large connected population, or this is it, there's kind of three tiny populations, kind of like we have in California, we don't know yet. Um, I'll come over to you in just a second. Um, we have a question on WebEx that I'm going to read for you. Does pelage color or pattern change over the season, or does a fox or a fox's life, or is it lifelong characteristic of an individual? Okay, the question was, does the pelage uh, of, of a red fox, I presume meaning whether it's black, cross, or red, uh, change over the, the life of the fox? The answer is no. Um, that's, a, that's a genetically, there are two genetic loci that code for the coat color, and that's basically fixed at birth. Um, so a single litter, it, 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 because it involves more than one locus, uh, the genetics are not, are not as straightforward as, you know, there's three genotypes and, and three phenotypes. It's a little more complex than that, but you can end up with a litter that actually has multiple, that has all three. You could have reds, crosses, and 
silvers or blacks in the same litter, depending on the genotypes of the parents. But it's fixed for life. Yeah, I have a, a biological and uh, a legal question. From uh, UCLA, a couple years ago, quite a few, uh, felt in Southern California that the middle management predators were deplete, being depleted by a species of special concern, of which we have one in the state, uh, the mountain lion. And uh, I was wondering if that's a hypothesis that would work in the Sierras, as they seem to be multiplying. And I was also wondering about the, does a species of special concern bypass uh, the ESA and CEQA? Wow. <laughs> okay, there are two questions there. Uh, and, and the first one I think I can come up with a good answer for. Uh, the first question was, uh, it, it, correct me if I'm misinterpreting it, are mountain lions potentially a threat to Sierra Nevada red foxes? Was that accurate? Was that your question? Uh, we don't think so. Um, we, uh, I'm not sure we've ever detected a mountain lion uh, in, the, in the portion of the study area where we're finding the foxes most of the time. Um, on the broader, st I know Chris Dermer has, has gotten mountain lions on camera, but he's he's sort of uh, surveying in, in other places. Now, you, you could ask, are there not foxes there because there are mountain lions there? And I, I wouldn't know the answer to that, but um, I I suspect that, that they're, they're not the first thing I would go to. I would think the coyotes, just based on abundance alone, would be a, a much more uh, likely threat in terms of competitors or larger carnivores. Second question. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to field this one to Esther Burkett. The second question was, does the, uh, the species of special concern status uh, uh, sort of bypass CEQA and NEPA, and sort of uh, is it parallel to the, uh, the sort of uh, threatened and endangered category? Thank you, Martin. Uh, species of special concern are not a legal category. It's a biological category, but we use it. Um, the analogy I like to use is those animals are in ICU, if you will, for a hospital analogy, whereas the T&E are in the emergency room. So, but it's not technically a full legal designation. Now, under CEQA, though, for impacts to species of special concern, there is a special section of CEQA. I can't remember exactly which one it is. It might be 15074. Margaret might know. But it has to do with um, making a determination for animals that may be at risk to such an extent in an area that they could be considered de facto threatened or endangered. 15 through 80. Thanks, Armand. So there is somewhat of a connection between SSC's species of special concern and CEQA, but not direct. It doesn't actually use species of special concern as the terminology in that CEQA clause. Hey, Ben. Um, I know everyone's probably mostly interested in the Sierra Nevada red fox, but the Sacramento Valley fox kind of holds a special place in my heart, so I'm going to ask you a question about the uh, Sacramento Valley red fox. Question. Um, so in, this is in regards to the occupancy work that's being done now. Um, you had one in seven detections um, for in, on the camera surveys that are being done now, and I'm curious to know um, how long that camera was in place before there was a detection. And um, the other question related to that is um, how long are those cameras going to be in place? 
um, is there a limited time on those, or are they going to be up indefinitely? Okay, so the, the question was about the Sacramento Valley Red Fox surveys. Uh, how long were the uh, camera stations up before the one fox of the seven predicted sites was actually detected, and how long are they going to be generally left up? Uh, I don't actually know how long in, in the first case, um, so I, that would be a question for a cat. Um, but three months, so well, 12 weeks is the uh, where is is what we had decided to leave them up. Thank you. Uh, my question is somewhat similar. It's about methods, and it goes back to the Sierra Nevada red fox. Um, you mentioned in the beginning part of your uh, presentation a lot of the history of what other people, researchers, thought about um, the presence of Sierra Nevada red fox or more or less the, like, the likelihood that they were extirpated. And a lot of that is based on um, mustelid surveys or uh, mesocarnivore surveys. And there are standard protocols that people have employed for quite some time, but they weren't detecting red fox. And it seems like some of those same folks may have surveyed areas where there are now red foxes at. Do you think there's a, a, a problem with the methods that were used? Or the, I shouldn't say a problem, but um, maybe a different method or different techniques should be used for Sierra Nevada red foxes versus mustelids? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, so the the question, if I if I correct me if I don't get it all, was the fact that uh, Sierra Nevada red foxes were overlooked for so long. Could that have related to the methodologies being used by the surveys, which at the time were primarily for mustelids? Uh, and and I think absolutely. I actually think there are there are a couple different aspects. One. Um, one is that most of those, there were some surveys for Martin, but by and large, the majority of those surveys were for Fisher, so that they were, they tended to be at lower elevation uh, in the lower montane, so they simply weren't high enough to detect Sierra Nevada red fox. Another issue um, is that up until recently, so this has nothing to do with what they were surveying for, but the technology uh, was so much less efficient. They were using Trailmaster cameras, which had 35 uh, 36 exposure rolls of film. Um, so in general, they, they just didn't detect as much. They'd run out of film before you could get back. Um, that you had to line up a receiver with an infrared beam, and if the wind came along or a squirrel or something and knocked it out, they'd malfunction. Uh, the batteries would die. Of course, that's still a little bit of a problem, but this was before lithium batteries. And so um, that's another. But, yeah, there was also um, an aspect, which is that um, – uh, forest service protocol was to put the bait higher in a tree, um, and specifically because they didn't want things like coyotes and bobcats, well, bobcats, I guess, could still get to them, but kind of coming and, and messing with the bait. So they put it higher in trees, and often, even though you did see a couple examples where red foxes, when pushed, will climb trees, um, typically they don't. And in fact, it's, it's kind of interesting because the one, that rediscovery in Sonora Pass was of a fox in a tree, and had that fox not sort of done that relatively unusual uh, for a red fox behavior, it wouldn't have been detected. And so that could well have a lot to do with it. And in fact, just kind of a case in point, um, John Perrine, even though he was using, you know, the antique Trailmaster camera setup and everything, during his dissertation, uh, 1998 to 2002, he set up camera grids lower to the ground specifically because he wanted to detect Sierra Nevada red foxes um, but in the caribou wilderness, uh, outside there, and then also in the national park. At the same time, Bill Zielinski's surveys were, were running right through at least the Forest Service component of where John's were. Same time, same place, John got several detections of red fox. Bill didn't get any. Well, I shouldn't say Bill because I'm sure there were many others involved, but the Forest Service surveys didn't detect them. Um, so that, and John thought that was all because of, of the uh, baits being put in the trees. So, yeah, I, I think that's a really important point. I mean, in other words, in retrospect, maybe it shouldn't be so surprising that 
they've been there and not detected. And I think that that's why, that's really the justification for Chris Dermer's surveys, is that we don't know that it's a needle in a haystack because nobody's really looked yet. So, you know, let's, let's do this right. Um, the only other thing on that, Brian, is those, not just cameras, but the Forest Service was using enclosed boxes for the mustelids to go in. And Keith Aubrey, who Ben referenced, said that's hard as you're trying to find with trapping. Same thing, the fox is less likely to go in a box. Sounds like a Dr. Seuss thing. Um, <laughs> my question was about the uh, Donner Pass, the Donner Pass fox if you want to talk about that. Oh, sure. And then maybe also these these foxes coming from the north up in Modoc and the Sage, because recently heard of another one up in um, the Butte Valley area. Oh, yeah. Boy. Yeah, these exceptions are mounting up to the point where I'm losing track of them. That's right. Um, yeah. Um, that was a lot of questions. Uh, so so the, the first part <laughs> of the, the question was, uh, if I would speak, to, there was a red fox uh, last fall that was uh, reported up by Donner Lake, and uh, uh, Kate, my, uh, my student who's working up in Sonora Pass, was able to go up and, and uh, get a scad and a pine cone that was chewed on and some DNA, and it turned out to have a non-native haplotype, a different non-native haplotype than either of the two males that I talked about, uh, but a non-native haplotype. We've yet to do the actual nuclear uh, genetic work, so we still can't say where it came from. It could have come from California side or uh, the Nevada side. We're not sure. Um, yeah, and, that, uh, and I guess uh, uh, there was a, a report from someone in the audience here uh, that uh, they saw one in the Tahoe area. So it could be that I, I do know the residents where that fox was hanging around begging for a while, haven't seen it. You know, it, it sort of took off a month or so after they first reported it, uh, but it may still be hanging around somewhere in the area. Um, Kate did try to trap and collar that one, um, but, you know, after a week or so gave up. Um, so we, we, don't, we don't have any info on that. Um, the, there have also, there was another fox that Pete Figura heard about and, and sampled up in uh, sort of the, um, what would you, south of Wairika, east of Mount, Sha uh, west of Mount Shasta, in the kind of lowland area that I-5 goes through, that kind of, uh, uh, yeah, low compared to the surrounding area. Uh, and that one uh, actually is we're not sure what to make of it. It had a native haplotype, but it also the, the haplotype is the, the least informative native haplotype because it's the one that's the most widespread. Um, when we did the microsatellites, the nuclear DNA, it assigns very closely to another kind of mystery population that we found on the Oregon coast. Um, and we expect that they're probably non-native, but honestly, we are not sure they're very they're definitely distinct from what's in the cascades so they're not they're not sierra nevada red foxes um we're we're not quite sure what to make of that fox and then the one you mentioned in surprise valley warner mountains area um well that's the tip of the iceberg i mean there's there's a lot going on right now in the great basin uh that we're kind of trying to piece together and uh, there are two things that are clear. Um, so I had a number of samples uh, up through 2010 from various mountain ranges that were, uh, for the most part, native. Um, and then in the last several years, in the northeastern part of the state, primarily close to Utah, red fox numbers have just been going way up. A lot of people seeing them. And those uh, we haven't done the assignments yet, but the haplotypes are a mixture of native and non-native. So uh, we're not really, we haven't figured out exactly what's going on with these Great Basin foxes. Um, so yeah, I, I can't say much to say other than stay tuned because uh, Preston, uh, one, of, one of my students, is 
going to attack that problem, and hopefully we'll get some clarity on it. Thanks, Ben. Um, Cal State Bakersfield's biology department came up with the uh, remittance men from England brought uh, a strain of red foxes from the East Coast into San Joaquin Valley for sport. Was there anything to that? So the, the question was that there's a, a, a would you say rumor a, a that that red foxes were were imported from the East Coast for fox hunting in the southern San Joaquin Valley. Um, I've I've actually gotten several reports like that um, that sound very credible to me, and I have no reason to doubt those reports. Um, I, I I can't verify. I I don't. I've not seen proof, but I I suspect that that has happened. Um, those foxes, though, I don't think were trapped in the wild because they all have. Um, they all have the same kind of genetic signatures of, of foxes that, that we can associate with fur farm uh, foxes. So I, they all sort of originate from captive stock, but they could easily have been imported for, for fox hunting. I've, I've heard that before. We're at 3 o'clock now, so I want to make sure that uh, Dr. Shax doesn't get a parking ticket. <laughs> so. Um, I want to thank you very much for, for your presentation and for taking the time to come and talk to us today. Thank you. Thank it was you. my pleasure. Oh, just hang up.